thank the Lord for his faithfulness. There's ways. I never quite understood at one time uh, what Jesus was really saying. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, it didn't bother me because, you know, he's, he's the way, the truth, and the life. But uh, in that order, too. So it, I began to realize that that's the order in coming to life. We want to know the truth. We want life, so we want to know the truth. But often we don't really come to know truth and fullness until we follow the way. That's Jesus, the way. And Jesus looked back when a couple of the disciples were following him. And they he saw them following and, you know, questioned them. And, and they said, where, where dwellest thou? So come and see. So they followed him and abode with him all that day. Now, what a tremendous thing, huh? To follow the Lord Jesus and then he invites you to come and stay with him all that day. He's ever present, you know. Every day we can follow him and, and, and abide with him. I know that there's a, a vast area of truth there that we have not yet possessed. And you know, I'm getting older, and it doesn't really, uh, what shall I say? Uh, not um, upset about it, but I just know there's vast areas in God we have not possessed. And I look for the Lord to do that, to bring his people in. <coughs> full possession <coughs> of their inheritance in God. Which at one time I used to, you know, what is that inheritance, you know? And the Bible uses similes of, uh, of the land being our inheritance. And, and, uh, and all these are, are just symbolic of uh, an inheritance we can't really describe. And we have the land of Canaan. God said it's your inheritance. God's given it to you. It's a fruitful land till this day. They're multiplied thousands. The feel if Israel just gets that land back, they'll be settled in their inheritance. And I, I think God gave them that land and and Abraham knew that he uh, walked in the land after he had separated from Lot. And Abraham gave Lot his choice. It seems we're just not pulling together too well, you know. We're, there's always uh, disagreements between your herdsmen and mine. And Lot, he had followed Abraham all the way from Ur of the Chaldees. And up in the heron, and God reminded Abraham, I, I told you to leave your country to the place, go to the place I would call you. So he got up and went again, and Lot followed. Lot seemed to have no particular revelation, except, well, Abraham's a man of God, I'm going to follow him, you know. I think a lot of people sort of have that concept of not really I, I, I don't need to know God you know for myself but I know he's a he's a good pastor of God he's a good man of God and do what he says and, but we can't be satisfied with that we've got to come to know him and Moses you know 
God's chosen vessel to deliver the nation. And Moses knew it. Because we're told that the Lord put in his heart to go and and, uh, identify with the people who were in bondage in Egypt. So I don't know if that was a sudden thing or what, but he finds himself away from the palace and down there with these humble Israelites working there in the brick pits, no doubt, or doing some heavy work. And he began to identify with them. God put in his heart. By faith, he forsook the comforts of Pharaoh's palace to identify with the people of God. His brethren is something that began to occupy his, his mind, the state of his brethren. For his mother who brought him up, so even though he was raised in the court of Pharaoh, his mother was his, his nurse. For how many years, I don't know, until he was fully on his own. And she told him what he, who he was and how God had spared his life. And it was for a purpose. And he knew it. And he thought, now is the time. So he goes out and identifies with his brethren. sees one being uh, beaten up by a, one of the Egyptian slave masters. He couldn't handle it. He went and took the man and children and buried him in the sand. And then the next day, two of the Israelites' brethren were quarreling. So they thought, we've got to settle this. So they went up to separate them and said, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Are you going to slay me like you slew the Egyptian yesterday? Well, he thought he had done that in secret. Now, where's that around? So he knew Pharaoh would be after him, so he took off. You can't imagine the grief in Moses' heart when he thought he was doing something valuable for the sake of his people and, you know, avenging them in their distress. And God had put it in his heart, it said. To share the lot of the people of God, and, and they they rejected him. You know, who are you to, you know? They they didn't know, they didn't understand where their deliverance really lay. And so it went against Moses to the point where he said, I just got to get out of here. He went off to the land of Midian. And uh, tended sheep for 40 years on the backside of the desert of Midian. Can you imagine <laughs> what he would feel like when he said, I'm a prince. In Egypt, our Pharaoh was concerned. I was a choice princess, according to secular history. I understand he was his favorite prince. And he blew it. He had political clout once, so he thought. And then he blew it. What, would he, what was he thinking all those days? You know? But he must have loved God. He must have loved him with all his heart, must have puzzled a lot what went wrong. But he must have loved God. Because one day, just going about the ordinary occupation of his, the days of his exile from home, from Egypt, so a little shrub there burning and he walked to the bed and looked at it again and it still burned. 
I suppose like a like tumbleweed of some kind. And what's wrong? That that thing should have collapsed long ago. So I will turn aside and see what this is all about. And God spoke. Take off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where I'm out standest is holy ground. And Moses bowed his head with reverence. And God gave him his great commission. Go back to Egypt and deliver your people. But God, I tried that 40 years ago, and now I'm 80 years old, and God don't call me, call somebody else. <laughs> What all he said, but not me, Lord, was the emphasis he had. Anybody but me. Where's all that zeal gone, Moses, that you had one time? <coughs> Strong, young prince in Egypt and with political power. And where's it all gone? God is preparing him for the day when he would have lost all human zeal. That in the lack of human zeal, it would be, it would be replaced with the zeal of the Lord. Remember that scripture? The zeal of the Lord will do this. And there's nothing wrong with zeal. It's something God puts there. But like any other trait of our nature, it has to go to the cross. But it's music. Yeah, people sometimes, that musical talent, first thing you know, they're pushed out into ministry. Unprepared. That has to be crucified before it comes forth in the, in, in the song of the Lord. So, God knows how to deal with the hearts of people that, that love him and that say, Lord, I want to go all the way with you. And then he begins to point out some of these pathways uh, that his people have gone in the past, the people that were used of him, that did God's will and accomplished great things in the kingdom. And that it takes preparation got to know his way. And so Moses learned the ways of God a little. No doubt. In those 40 years, and God called him, and God knew this was the time, and God wasn't going to take no for an answer. He tried to get out of it. I can't, Lord. I can't. I can't even speak properly. And uh, God, not me, you know. And it says the Lord actually got angry with him. But in spite of that, we know that God had prepared him for that hour, and God was insisting that he go, and his final excuse was, Lord, I, who am I to go down to, I fled from that place because they're out to kill me. What have I got to go down there? and deliver your people. And what's that in your hand? A stick. If you'd have, I guess, to tap the sheep once in a while, or <coughs> the wolf came to take after him, and stick, got to take them. That doesn't need any of our resources. What have you got? Oh, well, nothing, really. A stick will take that. In other words, Moses, God was likening Moses to that stick, dry stick. He delivered a nation in one night, perhaps two or three million of them, with a stick in his hand. So he went to Pharaoh, and you know, anything Moses would do that was miraculous. 
the Egyptians, the magicians would do. They did the same thing. And there's a lot of powder there in there, what we call the old cult. Wanted to do something, they do something. Finally, Moses cast the stick on the ground and became a serpent. Come here, Johnny, John Brees says, can you do that? Sure, they cast their stick on the ground, they become serpents. Moses' rod swallows them all up. And I know God doesn't really liken us to serpents. A serpent is an evil thing. But in a sense, God stoops down and takes from the gutter those who have been living this serpent life, you might say, and uses them to swallow up the serpents of the false cults that are around. I believe God's going to do great things in the end time. I believe we have a picture of what God would do all through the Old Testament. That's why I like the Old Testament. When when I began to realize that, wait now, but this is speaking of something else. This is just a type. This is just a picture of something else. And that something else is uh, what we want to know because... Uh, what they did back there that centuries ago or millenniums ago and preserved here in the Word of God for our edification, our comfort, our hope. So we learn from the Old Testament, but we must get into the New Testament. For the first probably 17 years, I think, 18 of my Christian experience. I'd read the Bible through every year. and uh, the, But I'd read the New Testament again before I'd go through the Bible again. So I'd go through the Bible right through Revelation and then read the New Testament and then start over. And I look at the Word of God very highly the Bible, the Scriptures. And I, I certainly never speak lightly of the Scriptures. But I know it's the letter. And I know that God all through the centuries has, has maintained the, this letter, this written Word of God. He's, he's kept it. Oh, we say there's so many different ideas now what this that means and that. I know there's a great language barrier between our English language and the Greek and or our, our English language and the Hebrew. There's a great barrier there, and that used to bother me a little. One time when I had some time in my hands, I thought I'd kind of get to know those originals scriptures and I started with Greek and I, I studied it quite uh, quite well for about three four months and then I had a different type of job I had a night job at the time and I had most of the day there to uh, do what I wanted and uh, people would come in I was working up in a lime plant off Cascade Island I was with the conscience objectors in the camp where most of them were Mennonites. And um, we got along very well with each other. The Mennonites even asked me to give them Bible study. Can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> and really that was my first uh, time I did anything like that because I never did it back in church I was going to. Of course, I was young and always had a pastor to look after things like that. But uh, those, were, those were good days. And then after a few years, they gave us the option of going to some industry where they couldn't uh, get men to go up 
because they could they could come down to the city there and get get the drug anywhere, you know. And they couldn't get men to go up some of these isolated areas, so and the Pacific Line Company up in Tech Bay Down was one of them, so you wanna go up there? And I heard reports that a lot of the boys that went there didn't like it. And, but anyway, I, I wanted to get out of the forestry camp I was in, so I volunteered. And so I was firing a, li a lime kiln for a few months. And it's one of those old type of uh, kilns that reminded me of uh, the furnace that Nebuchadnezzar threw uh, the three Hebrew children in. There was very big thing went up about 50 feet maybe and they dumped the rock in and trickled down and we got red hot, white hot actually, the limestone was just white hot and we had to stand there pouring in, the, pushing in the logs of wood to keep the flames going up there and, and go down below after a certain length of time and draw out the lime. And anyway, we had uh, some good fellowship there with some of the brethren, some Mennonites, some of the brethren. And uh, so in all these things, you know, you wonder, what's it all about, Lord, when, you know, I felt from my earliest days of childhood I could be a minister. And, and my concept, of course, is growing up Pentecostal churches, more or less, although we were always independent, there's some kind of independent Pentecostal meetings that we went to generally, although I remember going to Nazarene, the Salvation Army, and <coughs> Methodist, and you name it, because our folks were never did, were, they were never really denominationally minded, so I, none of our family got stuck on this is the, this is the way, this is the church, you will never leave this. Till this day, I mean, they they go where they felt the Lord wanted them to go, which perhaps is, wouldn't be for me, but you know, that's their choice. And I'm not saying it's good to go to these denominational churches, but that's been the beginnings of probably most of you people that you heard about the Lord. Perhaps most of you in your own home. Some of you know the Lord, maybe even in your home life as your children. I don't know. I'm saying is that God from the beginning has ordained a people for his glory. And he has his eye on you. He predestined you. And you can't discover your destiny until you come to know him. But he predestined you. And I'm not going to argue that point, which has divided church, the church all through church history. But it's wonderful to know that without even discussing it too thoroughly, whom he did foreknow, he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. So it's not a scary word. When the destiny God has ordained for you and I is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And so having that uh, background and, you know, knowing God's desire for my life, just very, very vaguely, I felt I must know the scriptures. And then I thought, if I just knew it in Greek and Hebrew, what an advantage it would be. After three or four months, I got a different job. I didn't have time to get into that. And I used to regret that later on. But I knew so very little Greek. I wouldn't say I know any Greek, really. But I had enough to handle a concordance and things like that. But I think it was during those thoughts that the Lord gave me this understanding. That the real Word of God is the Lord Jesus himself who was in the beginning with God and was God. That's the real word. Infinite in it. 
practical, infinite, eternal. And then in, when a man sinned, and then he had given creation as a revelation of himself. Before man sinned, all creation spoke forth the glory of God. And even after he sinned, that's the only Bible men had really until God gave a written word to Moses. How many centuries later, I don't know. Creation was the only word men had. And it, it was so clear that the Apostle Paul said that no man is without excuse. For the invisible things of him of the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that he made so that they are without excuse. Well then why uh, how do you find God then in nature? Well you don't really because our minds are so darkened. But in the beginning before the darkness had overwhelmed the human race. There was the knowledge of God that even after the fall, there was a knowledge of the true God. Even Cain, the murderer, God talked to him and he answered back and God told him what to do. And he said, you know, I'll put a mark upon you and I'll preserve your life. And, and there was a, a revelation of God and the things that he made. But God is a God of unfolding revelation, I believe. And even though it's still true that in the things that God has made, men are without excuse because there it is. You know very well <coughs> that there's no kind of machine or invention that man will ever come to, though I think they have dreams of it. Well, you could make an apple tree and have it produce apples tomatoes or whatever. And they might say, give us time, you know, and we'll do it. Uh, there's such a perverseness in the scientific world that we've got to get up there and find, there has to be another planet. This is just a little speck of dust in the universe. There's got to be more like them and we'll discover that and first thing you know, we'll be able to know how to get there and we'll have another planet to you know, continue on our work. Nothing will hinder them. God says, if I don't stop them, they're going to build this tower if I don't intervene. <laughs> so you can be sure God's going to put a stop to this whole thing. And though they build their nest in the stars, God says, I'll bring them down. <laughs> Think of the billions and billions of dollars to land a thing up there on Mars. <laughs> And people going, you know, in, living in poverty all over America, many places. Get out there and find a way to get up there. God won't allow that. He's given the earth to the sons of men and, and given man lordship over it. And man governs the earth and he hasn't made a good job of it. And, and as a result of his government of the earth, the earth and the state it's in now, which has to be undone. And I don't, I'm not saying that. I, I'm not talking about any number of years. I don't know. But when I was the age of you young people, it never occurred to us that planet Earth would wear out. Never occurred to us. Now they're afraid it's wearing out. Do something about it. Education is wearing out. I had a panel of scientists on the earth a couple of a few months ago from different nations. The fish in the sea are in danger. They said if if Canada and the states do not put a stop to this mass fishing of the ocean, within ten years there'll be hardly anything left. Great big trawlers with 
Let the growth go on how many hundred feet each time. Sweep them up there, they said. If we don't stop it, fish will become extinct. And so they're worried about these things. And, and of course, about the environment and the global warming and all that. And, and they're, they're scared for planet Earth. It will last 20, 30 years. thought in my own heart that when Peter said, we know it's the last time, and in the last days, scoffers will come saying, where's the promise that is coming? For all things continue as they were from the beginning. They're not saying that. They've gone past that. They're not saying everything's the way it was from the beginning. They say things are getting worse. This planet can't survive the way we're going. We're going to use up all the oxygen. Cut down the forests which produce oxygen. We're going to lose it. And you can understand the environmentalists getting concerned when they don't believe in God. They say, you know, they don't have anything. God saved us from this. And the Bible says it's all a King Jesus, King Jesus over all the earth now. Put all things under his feet. We don't see it yet, he said, but in God's mind and purpose, he's declared Christ to be king over all the earth. And that the old earth he's going to take and he's going to wrap it together like a garment and set it to one side. But thou art the same, thy years shall never end. So it's wonderful to have that hope, and I don't know how. I can understand why there's such a sense of hopelessness in wealthy countries. In wealthy countries. But you see, what, what hope is there? The whole thing is tottering. So uh, let's thank him continually. God, that you've opened my eyes to know that Lord Jesus, your king on the throne, God has established you in the holy hill of Zion, the heavenly Zion, the new Jerusalem, as king of all kings and lord of all lords, and the time comes when you're going to deal with the iniquity in this world. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. The triumph of the Lamb. never understood that until maybe halfway through life, maybe a little less. Because brought up in the church, the theme of Revelation was Antichrist. 666, beast out of the sea. You know, hailstones. And that was my thought of Revelation. It still is with, in most, with most people. Have you noticed in the newspapers in recent times how often they use the word apocalypse? Thinking of things that could happen. Apocalyptic? Sounds like it's apocalyptic. What does it mean? It's on the way out. But that's not the word. That's not what apocalyptic means. Apocalypse is a Greek word translated, the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's the apocalypse. The apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which means taking away the veil. It's the revelation of Jesus. That's what this book's about. The unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you read it in that light, you'll see all the way through the Lamb overcomes. And then you see a people following the Lamb whithersoever he goes. And they sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb, saying, Great and mighty are thy judgments, O God. They rejoice when Babylon falls. And the whole system is, we know it, collapses. There's going to be people rejoicing over it. Okay, but yeah, but what do we do then? The whole economy goes down. I don't know. <laughs> what would Israel do when they got across the Red Sea and they sang the victory song. They're free from their enemies. Now what? The next day is now what? They didn't know. 
So God had it all mapped out. He had it all mapped out for him. And they forgot that mighty deliverance from Egypt and began to murmur. A day goes by and their grub was getting a little a little lower in stock and and their water was maybe drying up and two days go by, three days go by and still nothing to eat around us at all and and they're complaining and they're crying out to Moses and he cries out to God and and they suddenly see a pool of water down there. Oh man, what what a thrill. I estimate there could be two to three million people counting the little children. 240,000 young men ready for war. How many would that mean today if there was 240,000 men your age and well, there's wives, there's children, there's older folks and beyond the age of warfare, two or three million out there in the wilderness, nothing to eat, that they could see, nothing to drink, no, that they could see. And we're facing days like that, I believe. And there'll be many people that will be totally devastated. Not boasting that we won't. It's never had any false boast. But now is the time, I believe, when God wants to assure us. He's the same God as he was when Moses led the people across the Red Sea. Devastating Egypt while they were there, devastating them, but sparing Goshen, where Israel lived, looking after them in Goshen. And of course, that was wonderful, Egypt's being judged, but he's looking after us. And then they leave Egypt, now who's going to look after us? No, this is no Goshen. This is no no place where you can grow gardens and no fruit trees here. God had it all figured out. So they saw this pool of water and they go running to it and they stoop down to drink and spit it out. Salty brine. Oh, God, what are you doing to us? And I wondered too, I used to wonder, why would God do that? the first stage of their journey when they were hungry and thirsty and famishing and weary of their trip down us, I don't know how far it was, three days journey. Here's a pool of water and it's it's briny. And I think it was some years later I realized that whole journey through the wilderness was a picture God was giving you an eye of the wilderness that we are. The wilderness that we are. So, going through the wilderness then is the God's revelation of our own hearts and minds and thoughts and words. Revealing what's really there. He's redeemed us, is he not? Yeah, he's redeemed us. We're his. But there's a fullness of redemption, I believe, yet to be revealed when we're redeemed fully from all that inner mass of corruption, which he accomplished at the cross, and he's given us a foretaste of it, I know. But as long as we have that carnal nature alive within us, to me, it's a sign that we have not yet entered into the full rest that pertains to the people of God. And God has it for us, but it's necessary that we go through these wildernesses. That God might reveal what's in our hearts. We examine our hearts. Oh, 90%? Yeah, 95% for God, maybe. But David went further and he said, No, Lord, you search me. You search me and know me 
and try myself to see if there be any wicked way in me. <laughs> so we invite him to search us out. Because we can search out with faulty eyes and give ourselves a good grade. Yeah. When God searches out, oh, there's nothing can escape. The gaze of those seven fiery eyes. And that's how he appears in the church when he rises up to deal with his church. It's, it's an awesome picture we see in the book of Revelation. Of the Son of Man standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which means that I'm here in the church to deal with the iniquity of the church. And so in one of the churches he appears as he that liveth and was dead and you know, alive forevermore. And that was a, a persecuted church. And many were being persecuted and slain for the cause of Christ. To others, uh, I am he that has the sword with the sharp. I have a mouth with a sharp two-edged sword proceeding from me. Rise up with that sharp two edged sword proceeding out of his mouth. He says, I'm going to come against this church and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Sword, word of God. Not this, but this that has become uh, part of our being. The truth that God has written here to convey to us but written within us. So certainly we honor the scriptures. And uh, I typed it out once and I I put marg I put references in here and there. I typed it out with a little portable typewriter. I brought it with me because when we go to Nanaimo uh this little girl there heard about this guy that typed out the Bible. And I don't, I didn't know where she heard it from. And she got my address from the teacher. I didn't know who she was. I did, thought I didn't. And uh, she wrote me. I heard that she wrote the Bible. But I thought, well, what does she mean by that? And I understood. Then I understood that someone had told her and she typed out the Bible. I thought that was awesome. And tell me about, what do you know about the Lord or something like that, 11-year-old girl. And so the next time I was out there, this teacher goes to the little group that uh, hopefully we'll be going to in, uh, next week. She's gone there many times. And she wrote and asked her to bring this Bible along, so I got it with me here. And uh, just to show some of the students here. And uh, so that's why I brought it, really. I do use it for a study Bible because it's, well, the print is as big as this, maybe just a little bigger, like written. But anyway, I, I love this book. I honor it. I know that it's not finished then. What, what do you mean? It's not completed having a Bible to take to church and to hear a preacher preach from it. That's not the purpose of it. That was the truth that's here to be so written in our hearts that we become, what does Paul say? Living epistles. We, the people, living epistles known and read of all men. And those people didn't have Bibles. Some of the scholars did. Perhaps some of the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, are available. But the New Testament church, when it was founded in might and in power and glory, didn't have a Bible. Paul, no doubt, had a copy of the Old Testament scriptures, and maybe some of the other apostles did, but they didn't have any New Testament written down. And that's when the church was founded and progressed and spread so rapidly throughout the Roman Empire that within a hundred years the estimated half the empire had been converted to Christ. Because the 
people of God was that Bible. So I just mentioned that because, yeah, we must stand true to this word and and but it's our defense. We don't have to defend it. They tried to wipe these scriptures from the earth many times. Never succeeded. God's kept it alive. But w what I want to emphasize is he kept it alive for his people that they might not just read it and know it and be able to write it out and so forth, but that it might be written within. And that's the new covenant. We say the new covenant, let's see, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Well, that's the letter of it. But the new covenant is this. I will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. That's the new covenant. God writes it in here. So when I understood that more fully, I had no more regrets for not having studied Greek and Hebrew. Thankful for the little bit I did of Greek, just that I can handle the concordance a little bit. I, I very seldom refer to the, to the Greek and the Hebrew, except in, you know, like a situation like a word like apocalypse might give us a little more understanding. It's, it's a revelation, it's Jesus Christ. It's just here in the book, but it, what's in the book must be expressed in us and throughout the earth. The unfolding, the unveiling, the taking away of the veil from the hearts and minds of people. For there's a veil, the prophet says, that lies upon all people. A veil. Paul knew that. That's why he said, God gave me a ministration of the gospel to cause men to see. We don't hear words like that. We've got the gospel. We know the gospel. Let's go to the nations with the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the, uh, uh, pass out the New Testament. And I do that, and I send New Testaments and Bibles to people that write me many times. I believe that. But that's not the full, that's not God's full intention. His full intention is that this which is called the New Covenant becomes the New Covenant here. Written not with ink, Paul says, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not with ink. And not in tables of stone, but with the fleshly tablets of the heart. Written there. That's the new covenant. God's going to write that new covenant in the hearts of his people. I believe the time has come when God wants us to know that and be ready for him to begin writing. Write it, Lord, in our hearts. Our minds. I think my mind is the thing that has been my greatest problem. My heart, I think, is right with God, but my mind can get off into such tangled areas. And, uh, Lord, clear my mind of all this stuff. Clear my mind. Clear my mind of Christ. And the enemy is there to, uh, you know, to clog our minds with all kinds of stuff. We can't walk down the street without seeing the works of, of the enemy. And Lord, give us the mind of Jesus. I believe God will have a people to walk down the streets of Vancouver and see all the sin and iniquity and debauchery that goes on. And through it all, look at it with the mind of Jesus. Not disturbed, not frustrated by it. I don't know why. It's just that's Lord of all. He's Lord of all. God wants to give us the mind of Jesus. I believe God wants the people walking on the earth as Jesus walked. With his heart, with his mind. Same mind. <coughs> He's given it to us. Yeah, I know, Lord, but there has to be an unfolding of it. I know you put it there, but there has to be the full growth of it. There has to be the metamorphosis of this worm that we are. There has to be a metamorphosis. 
I remember, I'll never forget it as a kid, almost every spring for, I don't know how old I was when I quit doing it, I'd find this fuzzy caterpillar, because somebody told me you could do that, put them in a jar, put some leaves in there, maybe a drop of moisture once in a while, and uh, put holes in the lid of the jar. To me, it's the most fascinating thing uh, in life is to see two or three weeks later the most beautiful creature come out of that cocoon and I'd take them out and I'd let them fly. I mean, it's totally amazing. <laughs> Worms. He saved them a worm, no man. <laughs> yeah, that's what we are. God wants to transform us. He wants to make us not crawling creatures, but <coughs> creatures of the heavenly atmosphere. Fly in the pure air of the heavenly realm. That's for us. In this life. I can't I can't take that off, even though I'm 